Hey, everybody. Welcome to uh, the latest Communications Network webinar. Glad to have you all here. Uh, I'm trying to send you a little something through this thingamabob here. And there we go. If you would, uh, you probably just saw something shout up, pop up in the chat box. Go ahead and start adding your names in there. Uh, if you're wondering where you are, the title slide here should tell you everything. You're at a Communications Network webinar that we're calling How to Create and communicate about sustainable events. My guess is you're here because you're kind of curious about what is a sustainable event? And this is something that we've been on a journey to try to figure out ourselves over the last several years. If you come to ComNet or some of our local events, you'll know that we're trying to be really mindful of the fact that whenever people gather, whether it's a dinner party at your house or certainly when you gather in a big conference like ComNet, there's a lot of stuff that you create and some of that stuff ends up going away and oftentimes ends up in hate to say this, but could end up in the garbage. So over the last few years at ComNet, we've been really mindful, what could we do to ensure that the food that we use isn't wasted, that the, the materials that we make could either be recycled or upcycled. And if you've been to ComNet, you may remember probably every single year I've walked around with a giant box called a TerraCycle box that tells you, and I try to scold you into saying, if you don't want your name badge or whatever, give it to me and I'll toss it in here. We promise to take responsibility for it. But what we're going to talk about today over the next hour, and I'm really excited about this. We've got some great people. We're going to share with you how you can do this as well. If you haven't already made it your practice, don't feel too bad. The reality is, is that for most folks, this is a fairly new thing. If you've heard about or maybe you even work in one of these lead buildings, P.S. we're going to tell you what that stands for. I didn't know until just recently. But if you work in one of those buildings, well, that sort of idea is now taking hold in the event space. And so at Comnet, one of the things we're talking about is how can we bring that into all the work that we do. So when we gather people, we can, we hope, eventually be part of a cohort of, of organizations that are among the first people to sign on and take a pledge to commit to making every event that we hold sustainable. We're doing our best right now, but there's things we can do better. And over the next hour, we're all going to learn about that. So we're joined today by a bunch of really great folks. I'm excited to, to get to chit chat with them and to have you get to know them a little bit. They're just awesome. Amy Kelly and Kathy Plume, who are from a company called Revolve. If you're heading down to ComNet Austin, which Bad news, everybody sold out today. So if you got your ticket, great, we're in for some fun. If you didn't, you'll be able to follow over the, over the web, which is a great kind of sustainable way to, to participate, at least from a distance. Uh, they're gonna be with us in Austin and they're gonna be helping us make ComNet 19 really amazing and, and even improving on some of the practices that perhaps we've been doing over the last couple of years. We're also gonna hear from Rianne Waters. Rianne's at the US Green Building Council. Those are the folks who, uh, who designated lean buildings and they also do, as you might imagine, lots of trade shows and events. So they're on this journey themselves. And then Sarah Patterson, who's at the Public Housing Authorities Directors Association. And like you, she puts on lots of events and has been thinking this stuff through quite a bit as well. So uh, why don't I go ahead, actually just before I do so, let's do a couple quick logistical things, which is if you take your finger or your mouse or whatever and scroll onto the screen, what you can see down at the bottom uh, are a bunch of boxes that pop up. You're gonna see one that says Q&A kind of in the middle and on the far right, it should say chat. That chat is a place for you to go ahead and add your name in and your organization. And then as you have questions, which we will be taking throughout the course of the hour, right? If you'll put your questions in that Q&A box, my colleagues, Stacy and Tristan are monitoring that. And they'll, you can actually upvote the questions so that we, uh, we make sure we get to the ones that you all think are most important. But we'll take that and, uh, and do that over the course of the hour. You can also, as I noted in here, hey, Felicia, noted in here, you can follow along on Twitter. Our colleague Yabby is gonna be taking notes and sharing those over the hashtag. Comnet Live, that's C-O-M-N-E-T-L-I-V-E. Hey, Meg, from the Maine Farmland Trust. My family and I are headed your way in just a few weeks. Hey, Miguel, nice to see you. All right, I'm gonna stop greeting everybody. I'm gonna go ahead and hand this off. Last thing I'm gonna tell you is, if you had a colleague who wanted to be part of this but just couldn't because maybe they're up in Maine on vacation or some other lovely place, we are recording it. We'll make it available on our YouTube channel in the next couple of days. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it off. Sarah, do you wanna go ahead and, uh, and introduce yourself? I guess, actually, last thing I'm supposed to do is, take you through our agenda, which is real quickly, here's what we're gonna talk about. Why these events matter, right? We're gonna talk about the plot pr planning process, if I can spit that out, which we're in the process of doing ourselves right now. We're gonna take some time for some questions. We're gonna give you a little bit of a framework of like, how can you build sustainable events? Cause you can't usually do them in like a week or two. Uh, and then we're gonna talk a little bit about some lessons that have been learned from the good smart folks around the way who are gonna be joining us this hour. We'll take some more questions and we'll call it a day. Uh, hope it's cool where you are. It's about 100 degrees here in DC. And with that, Sarah, uh, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? We'll take it from there. Great. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sarah Patterson. I'm the meetings director with the Public Housing Authority Directors Association. Um, and I also serve as a member of the Sustainability Events um, Committee for the Events Industry Council. And Hi, everyone. Uh, 
My name is Rianne Waters. I am a project manager with the U.S. Green Building Council, and I manage the conference education for uh, our USGBC events and also our sustainability operations globally. Hi, I'm Amy Kelly. I am managing partner here at Revolve. We're based here in D.C., sweltering away today. And I'm Kathy Plume. I'm the managing director of Revolve, and uh, all of us are on this panel today are true certified advisors, and that's a zero waste uh, specification under the U.S. Green Building Council. So I'm going to pass it back to Sarah to get us rolling. Great. Thank you, Kathy. Um, so why do sustainable events matter? Um, we're starting here with this kind of doomsday photo. You know, we've all seen these. Um, and really what this comes down to, you know, for your foundation and nonprofit, you know, perhaps sustainability is something that's woven into the fabric of your organization. Uh, that's just important to, to the mission of what you do. Maybe it's to meet um, member supporter expectations, maybe to differentiate yourselves, or maybe just a cost saving strategy. Um, but whatever it is, the bottom line is that events are your best touch point um, with your members and donors, and they should reflect your values and reinforce your brand. Um, events consume incredible amounts of energy and water and produce a lot of waste. Um, so as events ho event hosts, you have the, the power to really influence that impact and minimize it as much as possible. So we thought it would be helpful first to define what is event sustainability. Um, so the Events Industry Council uh, defines sustainability as preserving our natural environment, promoting a healthy, inclusive society, and supporting a thriving economy. So taking that definition, they broke this down into four principles that really underpin um, the new sustainable event standards that they have developed. Um, this is a helpful framework as you think about how to implement sustainability for your event. Um, the first one is that we're all responsible. So both the events hosts, the organizers, um, our vendors, or even our attendees, we are all responsible for working together to implement this and communicate um, our sustainability initiatives and values. Um, secondly, environmental practices. Um, this is probably the first thing that comes to mind, but conserving energy, uh, reducing the amount of waste that is um, created, and also managing your supply chain. Social considerations consider, include things like labor practices, uh, safety and security, as well as health and well-being. Um, economic practices, um, this collaboration and partnerships, your impact on the local economy, um, as well as transparency. Um, so those last three really kind of boil down to the, the adage of people, planet, profits, um, but apply them to events. Um, and you can see under these, um, these are the 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals um, that fit under each of these principles. Um, they were really informative as this um, group created these principles and might be a good starting place um, for you to start developing your own organization's objective as objectives as they relate to sustainable events. So the Events Industry Council will be release, releasing a new sustainable event standard later this fall. Um, drafts are available on the website right now for public comment. Um, but these standards are really meant to become a checklist for creating sustainable events. So I want you to think of this as we go through the, the webinar today as a tool and a roadmap um, to help you um, create your sustainable events and really take steps forward um, with that. So today, we're really trying to focus on progress and not perfection. Um, these sustainable uh, event standards will help you create a comprehensive plan, um, but the most important thing is to just get started. Um, whether your event is five people or 5,000 people, um, whether your event is in five years or maybe in five days, um, it's not about perfection, it's just about getting started and making some progress. Um, maybe just eliminating bottled water, um, using recycled content paper, um, just important that we start now. Great. I could not agree with Sarah more. A lot of people that I talk to about sustainable event planning get extremely intimidated and really overwhelmed. And the best thing I can tell them is to just try, just try something and just take things one bite at a time. 
because we, nobody expects you to become an expert overnight. Uh, so for example, when the U.S. Green Building Council got started, there, this was 25 years ago, there was no definition of a green building. There was no roadmap for how to develop a sustainable building. And so we created the LEED rating system. And many of you will recognize that today, 25 years later, green building has grown into a trillion dollar industry and LEED is one of the most widely used green building programs in the world. And so the good news for you guys, if you're just getting started on your sustainability journey, is that LEED and the U.S. Green Building Council, among many, many other organizations, have really kind of cleared that path for you and made it possible so that you could rely on and leverage things that the building that you're hosting your events in are already doing and so that you don't have to start from scratch. And so USGBC, uh, sorry, I keep calling it USGBC, but that's short for U.S. Green Building Council in case anybody gets lost. Um, our best known event is Green Build, um, and that's our flagship trade show. And because our mission is about uh, creating a more sustainable building, um, that we have to walk the walk. It's just part of our nature, part of our DNA, that our events that we host are sustainable. And so uh, in addition to Green Build, we've expanded internationally and we have a whole network of regional events. All that to say, uh, all events are different shapes, sizes, have different levels of resources. Not every event is gonna have what a 15,000 to 20,000 person trade show is gonna have. So when we went international, a lot of these events are at a much smaller scale and we had come across a brand new set of challenges um, and a lot fewer resources than we were typically used to um, and in some cases, these markets just weren't used to the types of requests we were making that we had started to take for granted in the United States. So we took an incremental back to basics approach. And that's what I recommend for anybody who's just getting started. Really just meet people where they're at. Meet, meet your venue where you're at. Meet your host city where they're at. And just take advantage of the things that they might already be doing and the things that you can start doing now. So if they have efficient lighting, if they have a rainwater capture system, if they have uh, great waste reduction efforts that they're doing, um, or even if they have existing community partnerships, those are things that you can take advantage of um, and really highlight in the way that you communicate your events. Um, so an, another great benefit for sustainable events, in case you're not already convinced, is that it's a great opportunity not just to represent your values, but also to earn media. Greenbuild has been uh, very fortunate to gain a lot of attention for doing things like breaking convention center waste diversion records um, and you know, our, our work in the community that we leave behind after the event leaves the host city. Uh, another great benefit is that you can create content. Uh, none of you should be surprised that millennials and Gen Z are starting to enter management positions and, and enter the workforce and they're demanding socially and environmentally responsible brands. And that should relate to everything. They wanna know that you're walking the walk. And if you're in the do-gooder business, like I know most of you are, uh, and your values tell you to be committed to social and environmental justice, this should show up everywhere in what you do, and that includes your events. Now, just to understand kind of how sustainable events are planned, that will help you to understand how to communicate those things. All right, so a lot of you will recognize this as the project cycle, um, but we're going to relate it to event planning and event communication, okay? And so it's a continuous cycle with each um, phase uh, improving upon the last, and we're going to go right through these one by one. Sarah and I will be switching off. So starting with the first phase, and I'm going to say that this is the most important phase because it will set the stage for your sustainable event. Um, if we can go on to the next slide, please. Um, so this is objective review and goal setting. So this, like I said, it's gonna set the stage for you. Uh, for those of you who are just starting out, you're gonna want to make sure you're setting the right strategic objectives. You'll see here on the screen, these are green build long-term sustainability objectives that we've been following since 2002. And you'll understand that I mean long-term. These should be your evergreen uh, objectives here. And I, it's totally fine if you guys want to use these objectives that Greenbuild has uh, as inspiration or somewhere to get started for creating your own objectives. However, I cannot stress enough that you want to create these 
objectives to align with your mission and the things that are important to your organization, because that will help you to be authentic in your sustainability journey. And that authenticity, I cannot stress enough how important that is, because you really want to avoid the appearance of greenwashing um, and truly tie your sustainability objectives to what your organization is hoping to achieve. It has the added benefit that if your objectives align with the organization, it'll help you get that leadership buy-in uh, from, from the folks that need to approve you know, different budget items and, and project timelines and such um, that you're gonna have to start implementing. So just a couple examples, if you're interested in, hung if your organization is talking about hunger and homelessness, maybe you want to focus your objectives around food waste. If you are more focused around global health, maybe you want to start looking into uh, carbon reduction strategies and responsible and healthy materials for your event. If you're a technology uh, organization, maybe you're focused on data collection or you host a STEM workshop. If you are more interested in female empowerment, then you're going to want to use vendors and go all the way back into your supply chain and make sure that you're uh, empowering women in your supply chain. So those are just a couple of different examples. The last thing on this slide is that goals are going to be different than your objectives. Goals are specific and unique to the event that you're working on. Objectives are evergreen. So for example, move towards a zero waste event is our long-term objective. And we have a goal of 90% waste diversion at our Green Build show in Atlanta this year. Okay, and this is Sarah again. I just wanted to chime in with how this um, first phase really relates to um, how you can use the sustainable events standard as a checklist. So this requires that you have a sustainability policy with executive um, support, which is very key, as we all know, to getting things done, um, that you have a sustainability plan and that you establish objectives and targets as well. So moving on to the second phase, uh, this is action planning and engagement. So we're taking all those lofty ideals and goals and really trying to figure out how we can make them happen in the practical uh, nature of events. Um, so this is when the communications team is often putting together their larger communications plan for the entire show. Um, this is the time to figure out how to tell your story and really to highlight the work that your organization is doing. Um, you also want to leverage partnerships. You know, are those your vendors, your suppliers, maybe um, other organizations in your space? How can you, um, you know, share stories and, and outreach and leverage everyone's media channels? Um, and also a reminder, be nimble. Um, we all start out with these high lofty goals, but sometimes um, we find out we just need to take a smaller, smaller step to get things started. So, so be ready for that. Going back to the standards, um, again, we want to under help folks understand how they can be a part of it, um, really start developing a plan, um, maybe make sure you have items on your website that highlight what the organization uh, will be doing at the show as well. All right, and that brings us into phase three. Uh, this is our implementation phase. So this is putting that plan and all those goals you worked so hard putting together into action. So this, this really translates into your pre-show marketing. So your goals um, that you've set already, um, if you've done a good job, then uh, you would have incorporated some regional and local priorities uh, to track that local media by putting the event in the context of the local host community. Um, so the challenge here is that we're still in implementation phase. The show hasn't begun. We don't have our results yet. But what you can start talking about, I have a couple ideas for you here on the screen, is that you can start talking about the process and the plan and really tell that story about what the initiatives you're planning to do are and how that relates to your mission and, and really get people on board and understanding why, why are we focusing on food waste here? What does that have to do with, with what we're working on here, okay? So a couple ideas here. Uh, as Sean mentioned earlier, uh, your home is an asset. So a lot of you are, are working in a LEED certified building or even just a building that has sustainable operations and you host events in your office or maybe you've selected a LEED certified hotel or convention center, et cetera. You can really lean on that, and I can't—I cannot keep saying it enough—that 
they, there are so many people and so many projects doing amazing things, not just with their own sustainable building operations, but with their connections with the community that you might not actually know too much about because you're not familiar with the host, uh, with the local community that you're hosting in. So really, really lean on your venue, really talk to them and have those conversations about what they're doing. Um, a couple other ideas here, uh, human interest profiles, if you want to focus on some of the, say, suppliers who are supplying your vegan fare for the event. Greenbuild went vegan last year, um, and that was that was a, definitely an adventure. Um, some behind the scenes stuff. If your folks are interested in, in kind of how the event is being planned, you can talk about the different things you're doing behind the scenes to make sure that this is an, an event that's sustainable as possible. Existing green features and policies, this goes back to what you're building and you're hosted, you're already doing. And then you can always roll out announcements as they come through and pepper those throughout your communications plan. Great. And again, back to our sustainable event standard checklist. Um, this is as you're preparing to go on site, making sure that your staff is trained and everyone is on board, um, that your everyone from your vendors to their attendee to your attendees know what they can do on site at the event to help you reach some diversion records or just bring along their own um, water bottle and really making sure that that plan, your waste plan and every all the implementation plans are ready to go. So on to um, phase number four with uh, on-site execution. So we are finally at the event. Um, everything is coming to life. Um, rubber is really hitting the road here. Um, on the event side, there's a lot of focus on tracking um, to make sure there's no greenwashing, that you're really able to document what you're able to achieve. Um, and on the communication side, this is all about uh, being ready to capture everything. There's so much content being created, whether it's behind the scenes work or whether it's uh, front of house uh, attendee engagement. Uh, the large photo here in the center is uh, an example from Greenbuild where attendees were asked to make a sustainability commitment once they arrived on site and put a magnet to the corresponding commitment that they were making for the week. Um, again, with the standards, uh, making sure that you have dedicated staff responsible for making sure that each of the all parts of your plan actually happen on site, um, plans for on-site verification, maybe a waste audit, um, and donation stations, and again, all great opportunities to capture that and highlight the work that your organization is doing. All right, and the last phase, this is your post-show reporting uh, and your post-show communications of the results and achievements that you've actually gotten from all of that work and implementation that you did for the event. And so this is going to be really crucial to understand what your audience is interested in when it comes to sustainability. Greenbuild's audience is the same as U.S. Green Building's audience. It's architects, it's designers, it's engineers, it's nerds. They want the data, they want the nitty gritty, they want to get deep into the waste diversion data and the carbon offset calculations. So our post-show report is 40 pages long. Your, um, your audience might not be interested in that. They might be much more interested in some storytelling or some of the community engagement pieces of your sustainability planning. So this is why those objectives and goals are so, so important, because if you set the right goals and objectives up front, then the results that you get at the end of the process will resonate with your audience. And then the last thing about this that I'll say is rinse and repeat. It's a cycle and you use the results and you figure out what worked, what didn't work, what can we do better to inform your goals for the next event. And again, going back to the standards, um, we are required to create a post-event sustainability report, tell the story and document what you're able to achieve, um, track the impact, economic, um, whether it's donations or a service project, and also report on those metrics, energy, water, waste. Um, so Rian and I have thrown a lot at you today. Um, we wanted to mention that we pulled a lot of this together in a resources document that is available through the chat. It'll also be available post webinar through the video. Um, lots of great resources there and um, we're excited to, to take some questions. 
All right, everybody, if you'll go ahead and start adding questions to the Q&A box, if you're wondering what I'm talking about, if you hover with your mouse or, or with your finger, whatever you're using, you'll see down at the bottom there is something that's uh, plugged in as Q&A. Just go ahead and type your questions in there. But I'll, I'll go ahead and start. Uh, I, maybe this is a good question for you, Sarah, or for you, Rianne, really anybody who wants to take it. So I have been amazed at how much, as we've been on our own journey, thinking about how can we make ComNet more sustainable, how incredibly important it is to announce that. And I know we're going to talk about the planning piece in a minute, but to let your partners know that that's part of your plan. Because people, I've been delighted and pleased to hear how many people want to help. People will come with ideas or you'll start learning about things. I'll give you a for instance. In Miami a couple of years ago, we were at the Fountain Blue Hotel. And I think unknown to a lot of folks was that hotel was deeply committed to being a sustainable building, despite the fact the building itself had been built and then retrofitted uh, but built in the, I guess, late 50s or early 60s have been retrofitted fairly recently to bring it up to code to lead certification. I think they've fallen just short because some of the old building practices. But among the things that they did was they actually had a whole wastewater plant that was built underneath the hotel and they used it as an uh, aquarium system. They actually used some of the gray water they produced to, to, to water plants that they were growing hydroponically underneath the hotel, if you can imagine that. And the rest of the water was being filtered and cleaned and they were using it to actually keep fish. As a matter of fact, the hotel was so cool, they actually had bought a fishing boat and a license. They had a licensed fisherman who worked for the hotel who would go out locally in local Florida waters and, and fish for the fish that would be served at the hotel's restaurants, which is a lot different than, say, bringing in fish from Alaska or out in the Pacific or perhaps elsewhere. They did everything really locally. It's a great way for us to tell a story about what does it look like to build a sustainable event? A lot of it has to do with working with partners. But I guess the question I put to you, Sarah, or to Rianne, or really anybody who wants to take it is, how do you ask questions of your partners to try to tease out what they're doing? Because I think had we not asked, we never would have known that there were all these practices in place inside of, in our case, it was a hotel. Great, um, I'll go ahead and um, start off here. So there's so much, and often as the organizer, you kind of take on this burden, like we said we're gonna do a sustainable event and now we have to do it. But the truth is, um, when you have partners, it's so much easier. So I think starting from a standpoint, um, you know, incorporating things into, for instance, your request for proposals when you're looking at venues or different vendors, that is key. But also, you know, when you talk to them, when you go and do site visits, you know, ask them, maybe give them a heads up in advance, like, what are you doing? Like, we want to celebrate you and your accomplishments. And when they feel like they are part of it, that they are maybe suggesting different initiatives that you hadn't even thought of, um, they're so much more invested um, in the entire process and um, more on board to help you throughout. Okay, a bunch of questions here. One other thing I just want to flag, I remember I promised Kathy that I would do this, is to really stress the idea when we're talking about sustainable events, it's really easy to think simply about environmental practices. That's where my head goes almost immediately. But sustainability is a richer idea. We're going to talk about that a little bit in the back half. But to give you an example of what that might look like if you're coming to ComNet this year in Austin, in years past, if you've been to Comnet, you know that we staff up. We hire a bunch of local folks to help us manage getting you your bags and helping you navigate the conference. And so one way we're thinking about that's a little bit different than maybe in years past is we're thinking, and we're going to try to do this for you all, is we're going to be bringing in people from the disabled community. So we're going to be looking for people who might otherwise have some challenges finding full-time work, but oftentimes work in a temporary basis at events like ours, like ComNet, and we'll be bringing them in. So we'll talk to you a little bit more about that as we firm up those plans, but it may be that the person that you're meeting for the first time at ComNet, the person who's helping you get your bag, is, is actually somebody who may be struggling a little bit with some kind of disability. And that's a real piece of our commitment to sustainability that goes beyond thinking about food waste or energy use. And I'll, with that in mind, let me go ahead and take a few of these questions and toss them out there. Nima asks, how do you navigate a relationship with a venue that doesn't, does not have their own sustainability practices? For example, the venue doesn't have an institutional composting or it contracts out their caterers. They just don't have a lot of control over a lot of the things happening within the building that we might expect. How do you do that? So this is Rian. So um, that's always a huge challenge. So we at the US Green Building Council have, uh, as I mentioned early on in the presentation, we are running into a lot of these challenges that, you know, there has been recycling and composting and wastewater um, 
capture and all of these wonderful things that our venues have been doing in the US and then we go to a place like India or Mexico and they look at us like we have our heads screwed on sideways. Um, so the challenge here is that a lot of times it is out of their control. We've worked with hotels where they're just a tenant of the building and they don't have any control over the waste that actually goes out through their haulers. The, um, the real challenge here is that you have to sell this to them as a partnership because that's truly what it is. Um, and what we've done in the past in order to kind of navigate this sort of situation is we have our contract language that requires certain sustainable um, practices that our hotels and our venues are required to do. And so having those conversations with them up front and making sure that they're signing on to them and that you have this um, this piece of paper to point to to say that they had committed to doing this that's always a great place to start and then walking them through the process and you know your organization might not be have the same resources that you the u.s green building council does to help them set up their own composting program but there are different vendors that you can look for that would help temporarily take any compost out of the system there are there are events like themselves by nature are, are temporary cities that you build and break down. And so there are plenty of vendors who can help your venue to do things like, I keep going back to composting, but really anything that is important to you uh, and your sustainability journey that as long as you're working with not just the venue, but the vendors as well, you can always find some sort of solution. All right, so uh, one person asks, and forgive us if this is a little bit of jargon for you, but they ask a, a question, which is, what is greenwashing? What is greenwashing? Grant, do you want to take that one? Sure. Um, so greenwashing is going to be essentially what I like to call inauthentic sustainability. And so this is something like if you are trying to reduce your waste by eliminating all of your plastic, um, single-use plastics at the venue, but then you're still using single-use plastics uh, in your like staff room. If you're not actually taking into account the entire picture of what you're doing uh, and not being honest about the actual impact that it has, that's, that's greenwashing. And this is Sarah, just to add to that, I think to really, this comes back to your tracking and really quantifying what it is you're trying to achieve, whether you're just saying zero waste or, you know, we recycled. It's like, well, how much did you recycle? Where did you recycle? Was it in the front of house where attendees could participate? It Was it in the back of house? So just really putting some parameters on saying what you achieved in very specific terms um, and not just saying like, we made our events sustainable. Um, that is really uh, a way to avoid greenwashing. Yeah, I think one thing I would add is just being really honest with people that it's a journey, right? So when we started this at ComNet, you know, we were learning as we went. And so every single year, I think we've gotten a little bit better. Uh, but our efforts are always going to be to try to improve our practices. Uh, now, a couple, a couple more questions and we'll jump back into the presentation. I see you over there, Stacey. We'll do it. Uh, what's your zero waste elevator pitch to attendees who you meet on the spot? at an event. So if someone comes up to you and says, okay, what's this whole thing? Why are we doing zero waste? Why, what, why is this important? And how can I take part? Why do I care? Hopefully no one says that to you, but if they did, what would you say? Great. This is Sarah, I'll go first. So I think it's really making it relatable. So, um, you know, back to that image I had at the beginning of water, a waterway just filled with plastic garbage, just saying, you know, events have a huge impact. The plastic that we use here could be around for hundreds of thousands of millions of years. So let's do what we can here to uh, minimize that impact and make the world uh, a more sustainable place. All right. Melissa asks, this is the last question for now. Meg, we will get to yours, but a little bit later, if you don't mind too terribly, because I think we're going to get to that. Uh, what's the panel's advice for an individual who is attending an event each year and is horrified by the lack of waste reduction or diversion techniques? So you're at an event and they are not doing anything, right? What can you do? There's hundreds of attendees, but no recycling. How do you approach an organization or a facility where you have zero influence? Are there best practices or contacts that you can share to help people maybe start thinking about this. 
Anyone want to take a swing at that one? How do you help? You're the attendee. You have no agency other than to suggest to your host that perhaps there's things that they could do a little bit better. How would you approach that? And are there any things that you could point to and say, read these three things? This is Sarah. Um, I would say, you know, there's one way that you could go and you could start posting um, pictures on social media of, you know, all the plastic that's being thrown away, the paper that could have been recycled, or, you know, maybe take a little bit more of a positive approach to it and just say, you know, post a picture of paper that could be recycled and just say, you know, maybe next year, host organization, um, we could work together to help, you know, find a local recycler that can minimize this impact. Just come at it as more of a partnership. Rianne, did you want to add to that? Yeah, I was going to say another thing that would be great for you to do is to talk to other attendees about it because the more people that are talking about it the more the organization hosting the event is going to pay attention yeah i would i would really strongly uh add to that you have agency because you are an attendee of that event and they want to hear from you so the more people who express a an interest in the sustainability of that event or uh, even outrage at the lack of sustainability that really does have an influence the more people uh, say something and social media that you know that'll really get their attention as well yeah as someone who hosts an event I'll tell you shaming is not my favorite but we're always trying to do better so people approaching us with ideas it's frequently just true people haven't thought about it you have to remember every event is as a reflection of an organization and their culture and cultures progress and take this journey at different paces. All right, so with that, why don't we go ahead and jump into the, the, the back half of this presentation, which Kathy and Amy are gonna lead. Thanks, Sean. So I'm gonna talk a bit about timeline now that, um, now that Sarah and Rayanne have done a great job of giving you an overview of the um, sustainable event cycle. So I know not everyone here is, uh, has to plan an annual event uh, that a couple of hundred people, if not a couple, of hundred, uh, a couple of thousand people attend every year. So there are elements of what I'm gonna talk about today that are applicable to your own staff meeting, to a holiday party. Uh, so bear with me here. This oh, one size doesn't fit all, but there are elements of this that are applicable to anything you're trying to do to make any event um, more sustainable. So we're gonna go to the next slide. And again, four to five years out, stay with me here. Um, not everybody's thinking this far out, but if you're doing an event like ComNet or the uh, Green Build, you should be. Um, so looking at the city, where are you gonna hold this event? And some of the big things to look at here are how easy is it for your participants to get there? Here, we're really, first thing to look at is really your carbon footprint. Can your participants drive to this event or carpool or ideally even walk? Because flying is going to be the biggest element of your carbon footprint. And if they need to fly to the city, it happens, not everybody lives in the same place, then can most of your participants get there by a direct flight? Because, and I, it's better to have just one flight, so a major hub city versus a secondary city, as most of the carbon that's um, emitted during flights happens during takeoff. So every time you add a leg to a flight, you're really increasing your carbon footprint. Then once you figure out, uh, another element to look at is how far away is the airport from the city center? Is there public transportation to get you into that uh, city center? Are there electric vehicle fleets, if not public transportation? How can you really look at cutting down on that footprint of, um, of where you're going to hold your event? Another thing to look at is the green, the greenness of the city that you're looking at. What are their policies? Austin, uh, my hometown, is really known now for its um, its uh, sustainability efforts um, and having an event in a city that touts those efforts is proud of them. Uh, it makes it e it'll make it easier for you to do some of the sustainability work that you want to do. And the last thing to look at are what are some of the policies um, that that city or that state has signed on to recently that make it an attractive or frankly an unattractive place to hold your event. 
Um, there's many cities have signed on to the We Are Still In with the Paris Accord. Uh, looking at those issues as well um, as a part of your consideration. Next. And then three to four years out, you really want to try starting to hone in where are you going to hold your event? Are, are you going to be able to have um, the event at the hotel? Is it going to be the hotel, the lodging, and the event going to be separate venues? Or can you walk between those venues? Again, trying to minimize that carbon footprint. Um, are, are these venues, what is their sustainability policy? Um, look at it. Um, are, if they don't have a sustainability policy, are they willing to sign your sustainability policy, which we hope you have by now? Um, have a conversation about it. I found that most venues, if they do have a sustainability policy, are more than happy to take you behind the house, back of the house, to see what's, what they're doing. They're proud of this. It's a lot of effort. So ask about it. Be, be nosy. Um, do they have composting? Do they use plastic water bottles? If they do usually use plastic water bottles, are they willing to opt out and use um, water stations for your event? Are they willing to work with you and help you make your event more sustainable? And uh, again, is it all ready? Um, and are they able to provide plant-based meals? As soon as you can get um, meat out of, those, out of the menu option, your carbon footprint, again, lowers a lot. So then six months, two years out, start being aspirational. You know, what are you, what are you thinking about when it comes to you, what do you want to implement at this event that's coming up? Um, start talking to, uh, to your participants about it. You know, toot your own horn. Establish your contracts with your vendors. And if, especially if you're going to have a marketplace or a, um, a, a, for a, a sales place, what are your vendors going to bring in there? Have them sign, develop a contract with them because a lot of vendors will come into a place, um, bring in carpeting, chairs, a bunch of swag, and then what happens to that stuff when the event's over? A lot of time it just ends, in land, uh, ends up in landfills. There are a lot of options to not having that happen. Donations, make that, um, make that, getting rid of the stuff post-event a part of your contract with those vendors. And then look beyond the typical swag ideas. Uh, are there, uh, could, could a company, instead of providing a water bottle, could they sponsor a refill water station? Um, you know, uh, are there other, could they, could they pay for the composting at the event? Are there other ways for, um, for companies to, spon to sponsor the event and to be a part of the sustainability effort. Because people want to jump on board once they hear about this. As Sean mentioned, you know, looking outside, thinking outside the box, hiring developmentally challenged people, at-risk people to perform some jobs. Um, and then finally figuring out what are you going to measure, who's going to measure that, and how are you going to communicate these, your sustainability efforts post-event. All right, then at the event, um, this is where the rubber really hits the road here. Make sure that your sustainability events are highlighted by your CEO, your keynote speakers. I mean, if everybody had a, um, a speaker like Sean, I think everybody, um, events around the world would be much more sustainable than they are right now. We've really got a great champion. Um, the other thing to look at is a uh, sustainability hashtag, you know, have people tweet about it, plant some tweets, you know, get some buzz going about what's sustainable. Sarah showed you at Greenville the, the magnets that people could put up with their own commitments to what they were going to do to make this a green event. Um, have fun with it. Um, incorporate it into your app. If you haven't, uh, hopefully you have a, an app for, uh, especially for large events, that'll cut down on your paper, your waste as well and just have a place where people can post pictures about this. And Sean, did you want to talk a little bit about, you want to give a forecast on what people can look forward to in Austin? Sure, yes, we've talked a little bit about this. There's a lot of stuff that we're thinking about. Someone's gonna be familiar to you if you've been to ComNet before. So we're gonna be doing, bringing back the, what we call TerraCycle boxes. It's actually a company called TerraCycle. Highly recommend it. You can do it for your next board meeting or actually your next conference. There's these enormous boxes and basically anything that's not food or that's touched food can go into those boxes 
and they make a commitment. They're a fantastic company. And they'll either recycle or upcycle all the materials. And so we do that with things like our badges and the lanyards and lots of the stuff, including some of the swag. One of the other things we're doing this year that we're really excited about and I'm hopeful and maybe even confident that a lot of our folks are going to help us with is we're asking our sponsors to forego giving away swag. I know everybody likes the swag bag and the water bottle and all the great stuff, the doodads that come with it. But what we're going to try to do to the extent that we can is, and there's been some folks who have already leading here, but to try to ask some of our sponsors to do something a little bit different, to make a donation to a local nonprofit or perhaps to create, uh, to buy passes for people to have an experience in Austin. Um, we've seen some amazing organizations doing this for the last few years. The Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, just to call out one, has been making donations on behalf of ComNet, uh, ComNet attendees. And frequently those, those uh, donations I think last year when we were in Miami or two years ago when we were in Miami, they actually made a donation to the Science Museum and also got everybody a pass to visit that brand new museum in the city, which is fantastic. So there's lots of things like that. And then I talked about we're going to be looking to, to bring in people who are perhaps developmentally challenged or living with a disability to work alongside us for those few days we're all together in Austin. And of course, we're trying to, and it differs from city to city, but we've had a lot of success over the years, not only composting food, but in those cities where it's legal to do so, we take the food that we have not used and we try to, first of all, if you don't cook it, it's oftentimes much easier to donate, but we try to take all the food that we don't use and we divert it, whether that's to a food kitchen or whether that's to a specific nonprofit, perhaps a homeless shelter, something of that nature. We try to make sure that everything that we're doing is, is going someplace that's useful, or at the very least, if it's not going to be used, it finds its way back into a system. It doesn't end up in the landfill or even worse, that horrible picture that we saw from Sarah at the outset out in the ocean, right? So there's a lot of things that we're thinking about. If you have ideas, we are all ears. And of course, we're grateful to Kathy and to Amy who are helping us think this through. They've taken us and given us a lot to think about. And you'll see a lot of that. And to the extent that we can, we're going to try to call it out for you. A couple other things to flag, and then I'll hand this back. Or you won't see much paper in Austin. So if you are a paper geek and you want to write stuff down, I would highly, we'll give you a notebook, I think. But beyond that, if you're looking for a paper pamphlet or uh, agenda, we're simply not going to do that for you guys this year. And I hope you understand now why we're going to be doing that. To every extent that we can, we're going to be ensuring we don't see any plastic or other things of that nature. And again, this is just a process. And we're really grateful to our partners down at the JW Marriott in Austin, which is a LEED certified building and has some wonderful sustainability practices because that has been really crucial. And with other partners we've worked with in the past, the menu plays a huge role in making it easier to set to meet those goals that you set for yourself. All right, why don't I hand it back? Great. Thanks, Sean. Um, see what I mean about our cheerleader here? So uh, post-event, communicate your successes. I mean, you've worked hard about this. Communicate the successes. And as importantly, talk about what didn't go as well as you would have liked. Uh, you know, we're, again, we're talking about progress, not perfection. Um, be real about it. Um, you know, so many, it's not all, it's not that easy. You're on the cutting edge of really making sustainable events work. Uh, it's harder. It shouldn't be harder, but you're cutting edge here. And so talk about that. It'll be really respected by others who are trying to do this. Um, abide by and communicate your post-event agreements. Make sure that that uh, swag residue ends up in a good place. Uh, all, those, uh, all that carpeting that people brought in. Um, Acknowledge where improvements can be made and establish uh, targets for future events. And so now I'm gonna pass it off to Amy to talk about some of our lessons learned over the last couple of years. Amy? Excellent, thanks Kathy. All right, let's end this with some lessons learned and some key takeaways. First one is obtain senior leadership buy-in. We certainly heard uh, Sarah and Rianne and, and Kathy touched on this as well. This is so important. I think everybody on this webinar knows that buy-in is the key to the success of new programs and initiatives, and they're gonna be the ones that make sure you get adequate time and resources to accomplish the objectives you've set. So again, another shout out to Sean. Uh, we can all see he has embraced this idea. He is running with it and is just a huge champion. So thank you very much. Uh, next is setting realistic goals. And part of this is going to depend on when you begin the planning process. And, and it will also depend on other parties. The uh, 
Kathy and I started working on Comnet 19 a little earlier this year, and the city and the venue had already been chosen. So you meet the venue and the host city where they're at. Yeah. And, you know, going back to that progress, not perfection, we're working with what we have to do everything we possibly can, given the, the cons current constraints and being as nimble as possible, as Sarah mentioned in her presentation. Don't bite off more than you can chew. Uh, assess what time and resources you have to work with and start with manageable efforts. And, you know, the first year you might be focusing on establishing a baseline and you know, you're going to identify and measure your impacts so you know where your biggest impacts are for your events and you can create a plan and work on reducing those impacts in subsequent years. That's actually really important. It may not sound like you're accomplishing much, but that is a huge first step. If you know what your impacts are, you are way down the line. Don't oversell your commitments. This goes back to being authentic, as uh, Rianne stated several times, and, and go, there's that greenwashing word again. I often see events claiming to be carbon neutral, but all that they've done is buy carbon credits to offset their emissions. And that is definitely greenwashing. So you really need to show that you have made concerted efforts to try and reduce your carbon footprint uh, of the event. And so that could be everything from, as, as uh, Kathy mentioned, making sure that your event is in a hub city so that people just have to take one plane instead of uh, a few to get there. Encouraging your participants to take public transit, to walk or bike between venues if there are more than one, and look at those, uh, the, the, uh, the meal plan. Uh, Brianne mentioned that they went vegan at Greenbelt. I saw Sean's ears perk up. I know that he would love to get there, so watch out, comment and attendees. And <laughs> Almond milk is in your future, people. <laughs> Let him know if that's something you'd like to see. Again, going back to that feedback, we really want to hear it. So, you know, reducing your beef, uh, lamb, and, and uh, pork, that actually, they have a huge carbon footprint when compared to other uh, meal plans, plant-based or even poultry. So look on cutting back those things. And then involve your attendees. Let them know that they are part of the solution and that their individual actions are critical to the overall, overall success of the sustainability of the event. People will take action when they know that their individual actions make a difference. I know a lot of you know that from fundraising. So this is where you can also have fun and be creative. So get everyone involved on social media. Uh, next, next bullet. Get everyone involved on social media, have them post pictures of their sustainability actions, let people, you know, and what they're doing, maybe have a sustainability bingo. So give your attendees a bingo card and give prizes to the attendees who get a bingo from all the sustainable actions that they do. And think about what you can do to eliminate or at least reduce the swag and stop giving out trinkets that are most likely destined for the landfill sooner rather than later. Sean mentioned some of the things that Comet 19 will be doing, going more towards virtual swag that emphasize experiences more than trinkets. Uh, so the, the sky's the limit and, and you're really only limited by your imagination. But the, the, the nice thing is that these creative experiences and, and items can really be a great way to create memorable conference experiences. And so I know we started out this webinar with a bit of doom and gloom on, uh, on Sarah's first slide there. So I want to leave on a more upbeat note. I, next slide. I indicated that individual actions can collectively help to make our events more sustainable. And so likewise, each of us working to make all of our events a little greener and communicating why this is important, it will collectively make a big 
difference and it will inspire others to start looking at the impacts of their own events and that will create a very positive snowball effect and so in this way we can all be working towards creating a world that's a little more sustainable and we'll go to questions Sorry, I got to take myself off mute there, guys. Uh, one person says, the panel mentioned resources. This was that slide, and we put it into the chat box as well. But, but you also mentioned building sustainability deliverables into your contracts with vendors at the beginning. Uh, do you have sample contract language that we could see? I have no idea how to weave this sort of language into a contract. I believe that USGBC provides uh, resources like that. Am I correct, Rianne? Yes. Yes. Uh, there, I have some sample contract language. We actually just went through a whole process of revamping our contract language. So those resources are Drops. not quite rolled out for the public yet, but I can, I can get them to you. And this is there. I wanted to mention that the US EPA also has a lot of great resources, whether it comes to a general sustainability policy, sustainable purchasing policies. Um, they have a lot of great sample language that can be taken directly. And um, I believe we have a, a link to the US EPA resources in that main resources document. Okay, another question about carbon offset. So Amy and, and Kathy, I know you said that's maybe not always the best practice or it feels a little bit like greenwashing, but the question comes, are there vendors that do this better than others and, and why? Yes, um, great question and yes. Um, there, are different, there are different calculators for, um, for determining the carbon footprint and there are different places to invest the carbon footprint. Best practices now indicate that um, investing, offsetting the carbon near the place where the event was held makes most sense. So if you were to um, hold an event in DC, you would want to find a certified um, project in the, around the DC area um, where you could provide the offsets. Um, that said, the number of um, certified projects are limited and, um, but Amy, do you want to talk a bit more about that? Well, I, I want to provide a bit of um, clarification. There's nothing wrong with buying offsets as long as you have worked on reducing your emissions elsewhere for the event, you know, with that uh, encouraging your attendees to reduce uh, or, or to take public transportation, for example, and, uh, and focusing more on plant-based foods for your meals. Once you've done that and, and you've been able to calculate the additional carbon emissions from your event, you are absolutely uh, able to off, you know, buy credits to offset the rest, and, and that would not be greenwashing. Gotcha. Another question comes from Kristen. Marketing examples that you all love, anyone on the panel that you love, that focused on the sustainable elements of the event. So what's a story out there that either you've helped create or that you've seen that you just thought that was a fabulous way to highlight some of the really smart practices that occurred? At these events? I think creating a, uh, a space on the app, and again this requires some forward thinking, but um, some space on the app that where uh, with a hashtag where people can talk about it and what they're doing and make the green, the sustainability aspect of the event cool and what everybody else wants to be doing. Um, you know the bingo game, uh, the you know I'm I walked um, the, the 10 blocks from the venue to the hotel this afternoon, um, you know, and funny pictures with that. Again, it really takes leadership. You might need to plant some of those just to get the momentum running on that. Uh, but that's, it, make it a fun part of the event and not a burden. Uh, and also remember that there's going to, there very likely will be some cost savings in, um, associated with, the sustainability effort that you're going through. Okay, question comes from Meg, and thank you to Melissa who offered her an answer online. Meg asks, do any of you have experience hosting events in which you have no infrastructure, in infrastructure-less environments? You're not at a hotel, right? This could be like a, a festival held on a city street or in the case of Meg, uh, 
looking for tips on building out the infrastructure needed to keep an event sustainable. And for, for context, she says that they hold most of their events literally in farm fields. So if you're going to hold an event in a farm field or in a public park or something of that nature, which may not have some of the benefits of a LEED certified building or other things, how do you get after this? How do you attack this problem? So I work on the uh, Cherry Blossom 10 Mile Run every year here in DC, and that is set up on the mall and taken off. You know, we have to set up and take off in, in one day, and it's 19,000 participants plus uh, is, uh, people just coming to, to view. So it's a huge endeavor, and it requires a significant, it, it's a year round planning. Uh, process, but uh, there is a sustainability team who that's all they work on throughout the year and you have to identify what the impacts are and then determine what the solutions are to reduce or minimize those impacts. For us, it is the trash generated from the, from the participants and the onlookers and I'm going to go back to the, it's a journey. We are still trying to work on uh, getting to zero waste. Uh, we, we, we're at about 90% waste diversion, which is technically considered zero waste. But when you look at how much that still is, that 10% still is, I, it, we're still pretty astounded. So uh, you've got to just it work in iterations and work figure out what works each year and what doesn't work and just keep trying to progress from there. And I'm happy to have a conversation offline and, and discuss this further if you'd like. And one more thing I'd just like to add to that is, you know, if you're looking at composting and recycling and waste, those are usually the three bins that you have at a, a sustainable event. Don't rely on your participants to know what goes in which bin. That really varies by city, by your compost hauler, by um, all sorts of things. I strongly suggest you saw a slide at Greenbuild where there was a volunteer group that was pointing to what goes where. Um, that's a group of, um, as I understand it, it's a group of students who get discounted rates to participate if they volunteer X number of hours and usually they're the ones at those bins saying what goes where. Another option, if you don't wanna have that many volunteers, is to put uh, pictures of the actual waste above the bins so that people know what goes where. Uh, you know, I, I consider myself a sustainability geek and I'm still confused sometimes about what goes where. So uh, making that as clear as possible, that will mean that you'll have less contamination of your product, be it compost, recycling, and it means that it's much more likely that that compost or recycling will actually be accepted by your compost hauler, accepted by your recycling hauler, and actually composted or recycled. Because the last thing you want to do is go to all this effort and just find out um, later somehow that, oh, you know what, there was so much, uh, Food, there was so much waste, food waste in that recycling bin, we had to take it all to the landfill. And that means it wasn't composted or recycled. So um, just help your participants and don't assume that everybody knows what goes where. And find other events like the one that you're holding and reach out to those organizers. Find out what they're doing to make it more sustainable or what has worked for them, what hasn't. And really learn from each other. That's what Sarah, Rianne, and Kathy and I all do. Yeah, and that's the purpose of the communications network. We're out of time, so I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there and simply say thank you to Kathy, Rian, Amy, and Sarah. I've learned a lot over the course of this hour. There's a lot still to be done. The really cool thing that maybe you should hear loud and clear is that with the leadership of folks at the U.S. Green Building Council and some other places, Kathy and Amy are pioneers here. We're very much, I think most of us who do this kind of work, are very much the beginning of this. It'll be interesting to see where this field goes over the next 10 or 15 years. And you have a chance to be, take a real leadership role. 
uh, just by taking some simple early steps and improving upon them year over year and talking to one another. Can't tell you how helpful it's been to us at Comnet to talk to other people to learn from, from these folks and from others to help us think about how to do that better. I'll leave you with a really cool story, and this is maybe speaks to the power of communications and storytelling. I was down in Austin not too long ago getting ready for our conference, and I met with a gentleman named Colin Wallace. Colin runs the Austin Parks Foundation. And if you don't know about the Austin City Limits Festival, so that big music festival they hold in a park just outside of Austin. They bring in great bands this year. They've got the Cure and Guns and Roses and a bunch of stuff. But one of their big challenges is they are hosting an event in a public park. And so, as you might imagine, lots of people are there and do their best because Austin's a wonderful place and they take their stuff and they recycle it or they put things in composting. But there's a lot of folks who don't, right? People who just leave stuff on the ground. And so one of the things they've started to do is they give out t-shirts. If you collect, I think it's uh, something like two or three bags of waste and help to sort it, uh, you go up to like a sorting center and these are just literally, you turn your attendees into volunteers, people who help you, you build an army. And these people get these t-shirts that say Austin City Limits or I help to keep Austin awesome or still weird or whatever it is. People love this stuff. They literally run out of t-shirts and they have people fighting over waste. If you can imagine that, that's such a cool idea. And if you're heading to Austin, Maybe you can see it for yourself because Austin City Limits Festival kicks off just at the end of ComNet. All right, that's the, uh, a good story, maybe a good place to stop. If you have more questions, go on to Twitter. If you go to the hashtag ComNet Live, you're going to find all the awesome notes that Yabby made. And of course, all these great, wonderful people are, I think, available on the internet, if I'm not mistaken. And we'll be sharing their, their Twitter handles so that you can ask them more questions. Thank you again. We'll see you again very soon. If you're in the D.C. area, stay cool. It's super hot out there. and We'll be for the next couple of days. All right, everybody. Be well. Cheers.